the case in Shashi. And we agreed we should just call them Shashi for this session, even the topic of the session. So that's the name that we put for one. Um, so he is getting his PhD in translation studies at IGNU. And he has co-edited with um, Four Rutledge a series of critical discourses in South Asia. Prior to that, he was commissioning editor of translation at um, OUP. Yeah? So his paper is uh, titled Publishing Dalit Feminist Womanist Writings and Afterlife of Four Dominant Class and Upper Class Urban Feminists and Their Issues. Dalit intellectuals since their statement came up with the term Dalit communism to describe a different politics. The inspiration was from black women in the US who coined the new term communism to describe their vantage point from which they saw black men less as patriarchal oppressors and more as comrades in their struggle against racism, which white feminists were as responsible for perpetrating white men. So Stephen writes, and with a similar rejection of the axiomatic term David feminism, I feel the best way to go far is to power our struggle with David feminism and to acknowledge that the language that feminism speaks is in our experience also one of the dominance which we have been struggling. At the same time, it's important to note that mainstream feminist scholarship and politics today struggles with its own legacy of exclusion of caste, and there are explosive engagements between Dalit and Savarna feminists, which is productive for both. And uh, I've quoted this from um, Seeing Like a Feminist. And uh, so now I will get to the uh, I have covered some of the issues in my abstract, so hence I am not going to read that out here. But today English has become the uh, Indian language, especially there is have got an extent to build a temple in the name of English mother, but majority of the Dalits speak their regional languages not English. So with uh, Mirabe, it was a sort of journal that mother had kept. Somehow that project did not see fruition. Until about a year ago, she still had the text with her. Fortunately, as Mira's copy was lost in the earthquake in Gujarat, when her building came down, and she was a present. Similarly, they were keen to publish Lady Kamle's book, which um, she read in Hindi as a translation done by Rajni Tilak. But then it got published by Colin Glassman. But because Kali and later Azuban have both had their roots firmly in the previous movement, questions of caste and class have been central to their discussions, and they have sought out Dalit text or work on caste consistently. So I should uh, also deal with other interesting aspects, like uh, how they source text that means commissioning part, because uh, the the whole process of a book starts from commissioning, book publishing, whether they commission our proposals comes to them. And uh, the answer was, it's a mix of both. And uh, the Dalit women speak out based on a two volume report. Um, it, was, uh, it was actually over she had approached uh, the editors like uh, Alessius and I shall deal with uh, the translation uh, part. Uh, today we are uh, talking about uh, the literature only because of translation. And we would be, I wouldn't have come to know about Punjabi uh, literature if they had not presented it here. And if it doesn't come out in uh, English or any other language that I know. And when it comes to social sciences, especially at the pedagogical level, English has been the given language and Indian languages have been the taking languages, <coughs> thanks to our education system. But when it comes to Dalit literature, Indian languages have been, hey, Dalit feminists need to think about whether they want to strengthen their own publications and publish their 
uh, where they want to publish with several of publishing houses like other publishing houses we see. And there's a need to strengthen uh, their own voice and their feminists, and it's absolutely important to publish in their own publications, but it's also important for very feminist voices to be out there so that the whole objectives are achieved, strengthening their own, but also ensuring that their own voices are not absent from other discourses. As far as Ruban is concerned, if, uh, this means that we become the second publishing, <coughs> Zuban becomes second publishing rather than the first, that's absolutely fine uh, because the important, important thing is the issue and politics. Issue and politics, not race. The um, pedagogy and uh, the translation. And Sharmila Arete has uh, uh, dealt with this uh, in her book, Narrative uh, Cast and Writing Gender, and then Women's Testimonials. And as uh, she uh, writes, the writings and manifestos in different Dalit women's um, in women's groups and uh, underlined that 1970s unmarked feminism has that followed the absence of feminist comparative work on issues of race and caste became apparent. Over the last two decades, women's studies in India had raised important questions about the invisibility, distortion and marginalization of gender as a category of analysis in the mainstream disciplines and their practices of canonization. Despite the feminist critics of mainstream, mainstream social sciences, the classical frameworks of caste had cast their shadow and women's studies too. That is, feminist critics of the 1990s posed challenges to feminist canons uh, curricular protocols and alliances with Brahminical power and privilege. Except for a few notable exceptions, women's studies scholars did not seriously engage with the Dalit feminist critics' reflections and uh, reflections on, on the transcending transporting of caste in feminist discourse and practices have been raised. The recognition of caste as not just a retrograde past, but an oppressive past reproduced as forms of inequality in modern society. It requires, therefore, that we integrate the questions of caste with those of class and gender. For feminist pedagogues and activists who seek to engage with these challenges, it is politically and for caste women a conflict with tradition and the desire to be modern. So, so how can our curricular and pedagogical practices move beyond these models that they that deny the agency of the red women? So we need to delve further into our failure both as teachers and students to connect the dimensions of a complex lived experience with critics of disciplinary knowledges and the academy. How can pedagogical strategies address this and develop critics? that empower subaltern students to represent themselves more positively. So I end with these questions. You know, before we move on to Kalpana's paper, I just want to say if people go in and out, please shut that door fully because we get a lot of noise from outside and so that becomes. I will quote from Umila Pawar's work. Life has taught me many things, showed me so much. It has also lashed me till bled. I don't know how much longer I'm going to live. Nor do I know in what form life is going to confront me. Let it come in any form. I'm ready to face it stoically. Pawar's quote clearly states that the Dalit woman is always underprivileged in her life and doubly oppressed <coughs> as compared to high caste women in their society. Most of these women's lives revolve around hassling between caste-based discrimination and patriarchal subjection. Education and writing is considered as a third grade or unnecessary requirement in their lives. However, these women unchain themselves from the shackles of their oppression and their literary representations by masculine pen. 
The most important point here is to be noted that Dalit women literature is undoubtedly influenced and motivated by the politics of Dr. Ambedkar's philosophy. The present paper is an attempt to highlight how Dr. Ambedkar's philosophies contributed to a wide range of independent writings and publishing like Dalit women. First of all, I would try to identify the texts that are translated and published in English. Later, I would bring out the aspects of why some texts are not translated and therefore not disseminated to people of other groups and their own groups. Gaining inspiration from Ambedkar, many women wrote on various topics. And to see the Oxford University Press, Columbia Press, we are publishing house, Dhamma publications. Some of, the, uh, some of you might not have even heard about these publications. Uh, Zuban, Kali and independent publishing houses have taken this challenge and revived a new culture of reading, which is explicitly for the feminine pen. This, these publishers have succeeded in bringing out the new trajectory, the new structure and new navigation from text of leisure to text of revolution. The Dalit Panther movement in the 1960s also contributed widely to Dalit female writings. If I were to suggest a name as the crusader of Dalit women writings and its dissemination, I would probably say Savitri Bhai Puli, because she did not write herself, but she is directly or indirectly responsible and compiled into the works of Dalit women writings. Maya Pandit's two translations of Dalit women's autobiography received earth shattering response from academia and other various groups. These are Baby Kamlis, The Prisons We Broke, and Umriya Pawas, The Weave of My Life. Both the translations question the social mobility and women's participation in politics. Kamli embraces Christianity because she suffered from the politics of Hinduism. She admits that her writings have sprouted from the seeds of Ambedkar's teaching. Under his influence, family and her relatives participated in the revolutionary activities. Similarly, Pawar's Weave of My Life talks about how she and her family survived on team baskets. This resonates so much of African American writer John Thomas King. The silenced voices in both the texts seem to break or outbreak the unjust law of their land and society. The point here is that Pandit's English translation of both the texts broke the myth that English is still the language of dominant caste and class because the translated texts paved way to the acknowledgement of unheard narrations and different literary canon. It can be undoubtedly said that English translation and the language did not try to superimpose the language of oppression, customary violence and philosophical participation. One of the major hurdles before Dalit female narration is their documentation of their experiences. Illiteracy is highly prevalent among Dalit women. There are many examples that if these fear voices are amplified through right channel, these can be documented in any language. Sumitra Pavis, Pan on Fire, originally collected in Marathi in 1988, is a volume that contains the accounts of eight illiterate Dalit women telling their life stories. Arjun Tawle's series, Homeless in My Land, A Corpse in the Wall, Poison Bread, translations from modern Marathi Dalit literature is a successful attempt to include noted writers Shantabai Kamli's work, Madhya Jarmachi, Chittakatha, and Kumut Pawar's Underscore, the Journal of Dalit and Tribal Studies, a newspaper called Khabar Lahariya, e journal called Sanghash, International Journal of Dalit Studies, and many others. In my last section, I will try to deal with the questions that why some of the very well known texts of Dalit women writers are not getting due attention as compared to other female writings in India. Perhaps the biggest aspect of this language, of language is that people from non-marginalized groups live with an insecurity that their language is also superior than the language of marginalized group. How, uh, there are two, two very well-known autobiographies by Dalit women in Hindi, that is Kaushalya Vaishnavi's Dora Abhishak and Shushila Takhore's Shikanje Kadar, which have not been translated in English, not in English nor, nor in any other Indian languages. So this is the, uh, this is, uh, it is needless to say that there is a lot of appropriation of uh, self-histories also. It is true that Dalit women writers challenge this class class of masculine pen while receiving and remembering their tortures and humiliation in life. It is not easy for translators to put forward these distant experiences in the very nature of English language. Moreover, the text written in the regional languages do suffer from this politics. Most of the publishers have a... Saying you know that's Pila and 
Prajna and all these words. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, that Maya is correct. Oh, yes, sorry. Also, Chief, you know, that you are uh, saying, um, you know, poison bread when you refer to, you said Kumut Pawar. It is Kumut Pawde. Pawde. So, I mean, these are some of the things. And then, third, I wanted to, but I wanted not to ask you because you are uh, a scholar. <laughs> Yes, this scholar, uh, too much generalization you are making, you know, that in two places I found uh, that uh, Dalit women, because you initially started by saying that uh, after uh, 1960, Dalit Panthers, women started writing, uh, you know, that so women are writing all over, and you very rightly said, you know, in Hindi, the, there are two Dalit autobiographies which are not being translated. So, at some places, very generalized, let's say, that is one. And number two, I just wanted to tell you that uh, the truth and maybe, you know, that uh, as we live in Sarafa, because uh, when we are talking about, say, uh, why certain things are not being translated. On Torah, on Shah, for Shania Vaipal, she reads her quite a few but she is a Marathi talk. She is a Marathi person. She is a Marathi person, Marathi person but she happens to write her Marathi in Now. This is a question, uh, it's a common question for both the presentations. I, I find the flaw of generalization in both. And I'll, I'll, I'll just try and clarify what I mean by that. Uh, there is an assumption <coughs> in both that Dalit feminist consciousness is homogeneous across the spectrum of Dalit communities in India. That's not so. Dalit feminist consciousness is uh, particularly sharp in Maharashtra, particularly sharp. And that's why you have, uh, you know, so many Dalit women writers, writers of autobiography and otherwise in Maharashtra rather than in other parts of the country. You also have Dalit women writers coming to the fore, Bama Sebakami in Tamil Nadu. Reason for that is Ambedkar and Peria. They have very, very gendered caste sensibilities. Okay. And their influences bring forth not just Dalit men, Dalit movements, but Dalit feminist movements. Okay. Elsewhere in the country, for instance in the Hindi belt, there is not so sharp a Dalit feminist consciousness. And I'm not surprised. If you look at the opposition to the women's reservation bill in Parliament, at the forefront of the opponents of the uh, uh, Dalit uh, of the women's resolution bill are men from the OBC communities, men from the Dalit communities. They are the ones. So, uh, African American women's movement and Dalit feminism, Dalit women's movement, uh, womanism was men mentioned in the first instance. Now, that's not very accurate. It's very comfortable, you know. African American movement, Dalit movement. African American women's movement, Dalit movement. It's very comfortable, but it's not accurate. I'll tell you one difference. For instance, in Alice Walker, who's coined the term womanism, uh, in the color purple, Alice Walker differentiates African American women's consciousness from African women's consciousness. You would remember the protagonist goes to the protagonist sister goes to Africa and finds the conditions of women in Africa abysmal. And she I mean she used to say to herself. Thank God I'm in the West. I'm not in Africa. Uh, the woman's movement, there is no, no feminist consciousness at all in Africa. So, uh, you know, there is while, while taking on feminism, meaning white feminism, and while taking on uh, black patriarchy, black men's patriarchy, African American women projecting womanism would not would not want to make common cause with African women. So, uh, there the presence of Western feminist ideology okay, uh, is seen as beneficial. Because African American women, where have they got their feminist consciousness from? While they demarcate themselves from white feminists, they still have got their feminist consciousness from uh, Western feminists. Uh, and uh, commented on that. Using feminists, Dalit feminists, 
and she uses this word. A woman. Is, yeah, womanism. And that was her clarification. Why I want, I would like to use this word. Right. And it was not sure. Right. No, but what I'm saying is womanism is fine. Yes. But it has to be distinguished from Dalit feminism. Right. And that's why I have used uh, a lot I know. of the feminist class. Yeah. Um, this is just a continuation of Mr. Basu's observation that Mr. Basu, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting what you said, the differential con uh, consciousness. But don't you think that holds true even for the category of Dalit in yeah, and it Dalit experiences? Sure, sure. And I feel, uh, seeing uh, the, both the conferences so far at least, I feel somewhere we are in the danger of not acknowledging this this uh, the Dalit consciousness, the differential uh, you know, yes. aspects of Dalit consciousness itself. We don't address it enough. I think we are yeah. very much in danger of falling into exactly. that homogenized idea of Dalit itself. Mm. Uh, you know, so and then, not enough the fissures or the schisms within yes. uh, the so Dalit. So perhaps it's not just to do with the feminism, but also with the idea the Dalit of Dalit movement itself. itself. And then yeah, the right. yeah. So the most of the downtrodden male political leaders or whatever uh, uh -huh. male um, uh, Dalit leaders, mm -hmm. they were opposed to the bill as it is. So I think did you make such a reference or no? No, 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 no. no. What I'm saying is yes. that in Maharashtra, for instance, or yes. in Tamil Nadu, thanks to the influence, which was a very gendered influence of Ambedkar on the one hand and Periyar on the other hand, right. if they combine their caste analysis with a sense of gender, okay. the importance of gender, that kind of caste plus gender analysis has been absent in the new okay. okay. As a result, the male, say, Dalit politicians or OBC politicians, when they foreground caste, okay. okay do not bring into their caste analysis an awareness or sufficient awareness of gender. That is the that 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 was my thing. But you cite an example of women bill or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Women yeah. yeah. bill. I said yeah. yeah. you know the, the OBC uh, leaders yeah. so, or or yeah. say the, uh, the the different different yeah. other leaders. Yeah. The male and Dalit uh, the, the Dalit and OBC block uh, Remind a stumbling block for the passage of uh, No, no, he is no. reminding for us Mulayam Singh no. 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 the other. But they have, they have another point. Of view. Um, I want to thank you again for coming, and I sincerely hope you'll be here tomorrow and the uh, day after that. And I want again second Tapa and Siro urging you to attend the conference dinner because um, we spent a little fortune on it. So if you're not sure whether you are um, entitled or not, you can ask us, you know, but I feel that our space is free that, that we might maybe fill even for those who, who don't uh, speak at this conference. And just one more thing before I, I let you go. Um, I didn't mention at the beginning that we have an email subscription list, you know, this is how we the network communicate. It's a bit clunky, but it, it seems to work you now, and since this is now the last event of the series, and if you're curious in terms of how we go on, that may be the only way you would know. Yeah? So if you want to have your email on our email subscription list, we, we, don't, we won't flood you with emails. There are it's modest, you know, sometimes there are little spurts, but usually it's quiet for months, you know, so you don't need to worry about that, you won't give it to anyone else, but it's it's uh, CC, so literally you see all the names, you know, we don't be CC there. First of all, my, my system doesn't let me allow me to do that, and I was quite like the transparency of, of doing that way. So thank you again, and we'll hope to see you fresh and refreshed in the morning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.